Permit records. Recording is on. Okay, great. Here we go. So I'm going to start the same way I usually start, and that's with some slides. So I'm going to walk through some um, things that I've prepared for this session. And then I want, uh, if there are any questions as we go, please stop me as we're going. Um, don't try and remember them to the end. Let's, let's make this really interactive. And also feel free at the end to ask any questions too. And if you have questions that occur to you after the session is over, feel free to jump into the Marketing Hub on Facebook um, and just put your questions in there. I'm on there quite a lot, so we'll get back to any questions that are given. Um, also, everyone feel free if you're part of the Marketing Hub of, on Facebook um, to, you know, to, to help each other if it's something that you've got experience in as well. So I think it's really nice if we have a, a really good community there where we can support each other with what we're learning. Um, so I'm going to share my screen and get started with the slides. Um, so you've got a fair bit to go through today. So I'm going to share this. Can, if you're not seeing some slides appear on your screen now, can someone just unmute and tell me there's an issue? <laughs> cool. Okay. So this session is covering email marketing for food enterprises. So I'm going to give some tools and tips. They will be quite simple to start with because this is more of a kind of a very basic action-led session. Um, we keep, I'm planning on doing some more things around email marketing in the coming weeks, where we might we'll go into more detail about specific points. Um, but for now, this is an overview and also really getting into GDPR, what it means and what it means for you and how to stay on the right side of it. Um, so I'm going to start with, yeah, some reasons why to take email marketing seriously. Um, so your email list is probably one of your most valuable marketing assets. And the reason why is because, well, first of all, you own your email list. Um, all of the work that you're doing on social media is great, but say if something really drastic changed with Facebook or if Instagram went out of business, might never happen, but you know, you never know, um, you would then lose that audience that you've created on those platforms. So at least with your email list, it's something that you, you own and it can be taken from you and you can and it, it's a way of totally having ownership of your relationship with your customers by having that contact with them so it's not you know for example with facebook you're reaching your customers through the algorithm which we talked about in the last session so facebook almost has some impact on who you can and can't talk to and how you reach them whereas with email that's between you and your customers so this is why it's so important to take email marketing seriously um, and because of the algorithm, this an email message is five times more likely to be seen than a post on Facebook by your customers. Um, and there's a few other stats here, but I'm going to share these slides like I always do on the Marketing Hub on Facebook. So if you're interested to have a read through then, then please do. The other thing I want to mention here is that 90% of emails arrive safely in your customer's inbox. And that's in comparison to an average of 2% delivery of your posts on, on Facebook. And that's due to the algorithm that, I, that I've talked about before. So it's a really solid way of reaching your customers. So this is this, I, you'll kind of feel a theme when I'm doing these sessions of the first thing that I'm, I'm going to talk about here is really knowing your audience. So the first thing to think about with any marketing at all is thinking about who you're talking to because marketing is essentially talking to your customers so with email being a, a route to talk to your customers it's really good when you're sitting down to think about how you want to touch how you want to reach your customers with email to think about who your customers are what they might find relevant and useful so a good thing to think about first of all is why would someone want to join your email list and a really simple answer to this is to support you because if someone's already a customer of yours then they already first of all it's just remembering that you already have something what you're doing is already of interest to them and it's likely because if people are buying from you in the alternative food scene it's likely that they care about the same things that you do and a lot of the time you'll, you'll find that your customers will want to support you and this rise over stat that's more social media focused on Facebook, but 84% of social users will share a post if it's about a cause that they care about. So it's just remembering that um, 
yeah, it's likely that your customers want to support you. And another thing to think about here is why they would join your email list is think about what value you can offer them. So for example, if you're using emails to remind your customers of your order cycles, that's actually a really useful thing for your customer. It's seeing it from that point of view that your customer I probably doesn't want to forget or miss out on an order cycle. So it's actually, and even if they see, if they're not ordering that week and they see a reminder, it won't be a nuisance to them because they'll be thinking, oh, it's nice that they're reminding me because I would have hate to have forgotten if I did want to order. So it's starting to kind of think of reaching your customers in a really positive way. I feel like um, email marketing has a bit of bad press because you know people complain about having full inboxes, etc. And I really think that it's important for what we're doing to not see it that way and, and, and really believe that your customers want to hear from you and the things that you can offer them, for example, order, order cycle reminders are of value to them. And then also there's just, this is a good one to think about when you're writing content for your marketing emails is, again, just constantly thinking about who your customers are, why they buy from you, what they're looking for, how can you help them and make things easier for them? Who are they and what do they care about and what do they need help with? And this was something I brought up with the customer retention session is that if you're not sure on any of these things, ask your customers, you could do a survey and you can also, once you have an email list, you can ask them through email as well. So don't be afraid to use your email list to encourage engagement, to encourage conversation on email with you. Although that comes with a caveat, if you really hate receiving emails, then that might not be for you. Um, yeah, so I'm going to move on because putting your customers at the centre is a, cent is, a, is a positive way of looking at the GDPR rules. So essentially what the GDPR is, it's a set of rules which are designed to protect people's information and data. And it does this by having a strict set of guidelines of how businesses can collect and process personal information. And positive way of looking at this is that it's, you know, as customers ourselves for a multitude of things, um, it's it's good to know that our data is being protected and that people need, that businesses, you need to use it in a way that is transparent and with integrity. So this is, a, this is it's a seeing it as a good thing and it's actually nothing to be afraid of. There's a few points that you need to be, you need to be aware of, but it's really important to be aware of these things anyway, because it helps you to, it helps you to talk with your customers and tr treat your customers with respect. So um, it's one thing to consider here because I think GDPR brings up quite a lot of fear, particularly in smaller businesses. So there's actually, there's a bit more leniency um, around non-compliance for small businesses. And also there is, because if someone has bought from you and they're your customer, it, they, there's also something called implied consent. So this means, again, if you are, are contacting customers who have already bought from you about something that is relevant to what they have bought, then there's also this, in, there's, there's a kind of implied consent around that interaction in that they're interested in hearing more from you. So for this reason, emailing your customers to ask them to sign up for your mailing list is actually a very low risk um, thing to do. I've put a link here to a legal company who've written a blog post about this, which I found really helpful. Um, and it just kind of takes away that fear from emailing your customers to ask them to join your mailing list. And even though this is the case, it's also really important to be aware of the rules and to comply. Um, and I think the main reason for this, it, it comes back to that relationship you have with your customer. Imagine how you would feel if you're kind of speaking face to face with your customer and you have um, had a, a, you know, all of your email list had been stolen by someone. It's kind of a really dramatic example, which will probably never happen to any of us. But <laughs> it's like that you want to treat your customer's data um, with care. And, you know, it's imagine if you're talking to a customer and you've given their email to another company that they don't have anything to do with or aren't interested in. And, and that company is now bombarding them with emails because of something you did. It's something that you'd feel really, it's, it's not good for your relationship. So, um, but this is the kind of thing that might have been happening before GDPR. So it's, it's understanding that it's good to know the rules and it's actually good to be GDPR compliant. 
I've, this is just a summary of the main rules that would apply to your food enterprise. So one of the really basic parts of GDPR is just to make sure that you only collect data that is for a specific purpose, which you make clear to those whose data you hold. So don't hold or use this data for any other purpose than the purpose you've outlined. So say, for example, if people subscribe to your mailing list and you say that you're going to email them from time to time with offers, with order cycle reminders, with newsletters and your latest news, then it's making sure that you don't take, so first of all, that you don't use it for something else, i.e. giving it to another company to email them about, uh, I'm trying to think of something really unrelated, like, I, I don't know what, like pictures, maybe picture frames, picture frame companies, it's like unrelated to what you do. So it's, you're using it for something that's not what you said you'd use it for. Um, the Or even if you emailed your, rather than giving it away, even if you emailed your subscribers about something that's unrelated to your company, again, that would be against what you said you were doing. So this is also really important for customer trust, which is really, it's really, it is a vital part of um, your relationship with your customer, customer retention and growing as a business and maintaining your integrity. So this is a really good practice anyway. Um, the other thing is not to use this data. Um, the other thing is to only collect the data that's relevant for what you're going to use it for. So for example, if you're just emailing people about order cycle closing, etc., the ones I've just outlined, then you don't need any further data from them other than their name and their email address and maybe their location. But if you're asking things like sexual orientation, then this falls into a, like this, this is a uh, it falls into a kind of a set of special data points which you need to be really careful around so it's just not asking for any data that you're not going to need to be able to do what you said you're going to do with the data and it's also the other point is to make sure you have consent to use this data for, this, for the purpose that you've outlined and also to make it easy for people to withdraw consent so making sure there's a really clear way for people to unsubscribe from your email list I'm going to go into this in a little bit more detail because I'm going to show you step by step how to um, work this with MailChimp um, because they have a really, really awesome way. To, uh, yeah, a really awesome thing that you can add to your sign it up forms to do a lot of this for you. Um, so, yeah, and it's also it, it's important to have consent from your customers, not just to yeah it, it's, you'll see a theme that it's, it's important to have consent from your customers not just so that your gdpr compliant and don't get into trouble but it's important as well for your customer relationships so all of these are actually good things for your relationship with your customers um the other point to be careful of is to only hold the minimum amount of data necessary for the consented task which i've mentioned and only to keep this data for as long as necessary to complete this task so if they're on a mailing list for marketing emails that means you can keep their data for as long as you're made it, like marketing to them um, through your email list. A question mark here might be if they're a long-term lapsed customer. So if they haven't bought with you for maybe over, you know, it, this, again, there's no real tight rules on this, but it's something to just consider if you're holding emails from someone that's not, yeah, bought from you for a year, then there's a question mark. But then as long as you're making it very, clear and easy how people can unsubscribe from your email list, which you can, which is an automatic thing with emails from MailChimp anyway, then you're, this again should not be a risk for you. And one of the most important points on here, that, which is where small businesses could theoretically come afoul of GDPR practices is to you need to protect the data you're storing against unauthorized access and to report any data breaches. So. On this link that I've put here, there's more details on this. Again, it's probably something you will never have to worry about. And the only reason you'd have to report it is if there's a risk attached to that data breach. And if it's just an email and a name, it's probably very low risk. Usually these are things like if bank details have been, yeah. But there's more detail here on that link if you're interested in that point. Um, so it's just, if you're, if you're keeping your email list on MailChimp, for example, then that shouldn't be a problem because they a MailChimp has got good good security and if you are keeping it on an Excel sheet on your computer it would just be worthwhile making sure that your computer is password protected and having a, having a think about 
who else would have access to your computer and could see that sheet? So it's just starting to think more security minded if you're carrying people's personal details. Um, is there any questions here from anybody? Okay, great. So I'm now going to move on to a session where I'm just going to walk through how to set up a really useful tool in MailChimp. So it's how to make sure that your MailChimp landing pages or emails are GDP, um, your sign up pages are GDPR compliant. So what I've, I'm going to leave these slides here because this will be for you to check on later. I'm going to walk through it on the computer and tell you. So if you want to look at this later, there's step by step on this page here. And then also further information here. But these two slides I'm going to show you here. So if I click MailChimp and if I log in, and I'm going to log in with one I made earlier. Great, so once you're here, what you want to do is you want to go to your audience, then manage audience, click on the drop down, and then go to settings. And then on the settings page, you want to scroll down and go to GDPR field and settings, and then click on this. And then you will see this page here. So what you want to do here, this will be unticked. I was playing this earlier, so it's ticked it for me. But um, So you want to tick on this. That's enable GDPR fields on sign-up forms. So what this will now do is on your landing pages or if you've created any sign-up forms with MailChimp that people can go to to sign up to your mailing list, this will then add this form, which I'm going to show you in a minute what it looks like. It will add this form to that landing page then that means that when anyone is subscribing to your mailing list, they will then have to give their consent for your marketing practices. So it just, this is, this is a way to be 100, you know, to, not 100 because it's an ongoing process, but this is a way to remove a lot more risk around your email marketing of coming afoul of GDPR. And so here you could title this wherever you want. You can leave it marketing permissions. So in the description so i would put i would move this down and in the description here i've put a little note here so you can come back to this on the slide for example you want to put a little note like please support us by allowing us to keep in touch with you we'll only use your email to let you know about new produce to offer useful information to send you a reminder when our order cycle is open about to close so you don't miss it please select below, select below how you would like to hear from us so this is just an example but you can amend this how how you like. Um, so I'm just going to copy that paste in here and then maybe delete that one. And then that will show up on the form. And then here, here is where you can choose the ways that you might contact the person who's signing up to your mailing list. So direct mail, you probably aren't going to need. Customized online advertising, you probably aren't going to need either. Um, email is what the way that you're going to contact them. So essentially this will show up on the form with how would you like to hear from us? And then they tick a tick box next to email and that's them giving their consent that they're happy to hear from you via email. And that means that then they, you have their consent to use their email address to send them the email marketing that you've outlined, which means that you're GD compliant. But then obviously the things behind that that you're doing is protecting their information by not sharing with anyone else and being careful about your security, et cetera. So it's not just this one step, it's just having an overall, yeah, it's just taking good care of people's information as well as making sure you have their consent to use their information. Then you can tick or untick this box. So tick it to say that you require this to be selected. So that means that you're requiring that they give their consent. And then legal text, here you can just put, you can carry on with what um, MailChimp have put here, it's fine. So you can unsubscribe at any time. That will come up every time you email them through MailChimp, they will, they, you'll have an unsubscribe option at the bottom of the email. And I mean, you could delete this if you wanted. Um, for information about our privacy practices, 
please get in touch, for example. So they could email you and you could say how you're storing the information. So I use a spreadsheet where I password protect it or everything is only stored on MailChimp. Um, so it's protected through MailChimp. So or you could just remove this all together. Um, so I think just showing people how they can unscribe is fine. And then save GDPR settings. So I hope this isn't going to confuse those who aren't using MailChimp at the moment. I'm going to do more on MailChimp. It's good to do this as almost like a first step, because if you create a landing page, that I think if you've already got one running, it will add this automatically. But when you just start with MailChimp, it doesn't automatically do this GDPR um, opt-in with your forms. So it's something that you need to turn on. The reason why is that MailChimp is a US company and in the US, you don't have to worry about GDPR unless you are marketing to a European audience. So not everyone that uses MailChimp needs to worry about this, um, but we do. So you actually need to go do the, op the steps that I've just said to turn, to turn this on. So then if we go back to our, you click on this guy to go back to your overall page, which is the home page essentially. So then if we go to create, and then if we go to landing page, landing page name, and we're gonna call it email sign up page. Begin. So, this now creates, this was, uh, so you scroll down, I would just go for something very simple. So when you get this page, select template, scroll down and choose grow your list. You can play with the other ones if you want to, but I'd start simple. And sometimes it's better not to confuse your customers by putting too much in, in one page. Oh. Let's choose, my, let's choose my different one for me. That's strange. So I'm going to go back and choose that one. If it lets me change templates. Okay, cool. So now we have, this would be our land, the landing page that we're building. You can add and amend anything here. So for those that haven't used MailChimp before, you click on the box here and then you edit on the right. So that takes a bit of getting used to because you expect to be able to click in it and write in it, but click on the box, edit here. So you could put, um, join our community, for example. And then here, we can even copy and paste the same thing we put in our description. Um, if you want or amend it uh, please support us by joining our community or joining our mailing list, however you want to call it. Um, and we will contact you to let you know about new la la and then delete the bottom bit. So there's just like a quick message. And then here, so you want to click save and close once you finish writing. So here is where people add the email address. I would click on this box and then at least get their first name because it's really important and I'd make that required. It's really important to personalize your emails, which I will explain a bit later. It's about deliverability. So add first name. So that's by clicking on this box and then take the option from here, save and close. Then here we've got marketing permissions. So this is the thing that we just did to set up your GDPR form options is what means that this now will automatically come up whenever you create a landing page or a sign up form. So this means that when someone else, when, when one of your customers wants to sign up, they'll see this message, they'll have to click here and then click subscribe. Um, subscribe. And then that means that you've got, yeah, like this, this extra layer of protection about GDPR. So save and close. And that's here. So this is then you'd fill out the extra details. Um, and this would then be the link that you could then copy and paste and put it into your email that you send um, to invite people to join your mailing list. So you want to take, so finish all of these points. So that's your content, page title, URL, audience. That's where you'd add 
who you want to send it to. Um, or sorry, okay, I'm thinking about sending an email, so ignore this for now. <laughs> um, just copy the URL and publish. And then you've got the landing page. So I'd copy and paste this. And then later on, we just put that into an email, which I'm just going to make a Gmail and just put it in there for now. Okay, so do we have any questions so far just about those steps? So, sorry, do we need do we need our own privacy policy then? Do I need or does, does Mailchimp's one cover that? Um, it's hmm, it's it's good to have a privacy policy. I don't think it's something that you need to worry about too much unless you've got your own website. Um, I think a privacy policy, I mean, I mean, you could start with just having a template, like you could Google just a template of a general privacy policy, read through, see what applies to you. It could be something as simple as, for example, telling people how you use their data and that you won't share, you know, that you won't share it with anyone else, for example, and that you take steps to ensure that it's safe, that it's safe, i.e. through password, only using it on a path, only storing information on a password protected computer. Um, I don't think that it's something that you're going to have to worry about at this point. I think if you're doing your email marketing through MailChimp, it's, yeah, it, it's not something that you're personally going to have to worry about. I think if you had your own, yeah, if you were if you were kind of running your own, if you had your own separate website um, and you were storing information on there, if you had sign up forms, or then maybe. But I would say at this point, it's not something that you'd have to worry about. But it's probably a good practice just to have a look online to see a general template small business privacy policy, and even just use that as your privacy policy. So yeah, you're probably doing a lot of the things already, particularly as we're going through some of these steps for GDPR. These are, I mean, even just doing this with MailChimp and adding the GDPR form, that's more than what a lot of brands are doing. Um, so you're already in a safer camp than I'd, I'd say probably more than 50% of small businesses in the UK. So it's, yeah, it's always an ongoing process to kind of really tighten up these things. So it's, it's good to have an outline one, um, but that would only, you know, for example, if you said email me, if, email us if you'd like to know more about a privacy policy, it's unlikely you would ever get an email asking about your privacy policy. But it's, again, it's going back to this um, relationship with your customers where it's really good that you are protecting the data that you're storing against unauthorized access. So for example, using a password protected computer, um, taking care not to share your computer with anyone else, or you could password protect the, if you're keeping it on the spreadsheet, you could password protect that spreadsheet itself so that it's safe. Um, so it's just making sure you're taking reasonable steps um, to look after people's information. But another point here is that your an email, a name and an email address wouldn't, it it's not in the kind of sensitive information bracket. So if you were if you were keeping more kind of personal information like health information or for example ethnicity or gender or um sex or sexual orientation that would be considered uh sensitive so there's more strict rules around that so you probably have to have a much more robust privacy policy so it's it's kind of it, yeah that the gdpr rules themselves I and mean, it's like a 99 page kind of document and a lot of stuff isn't fully totally clear so there's yeah it's again it's it's just thinking about your relationship with your customer first and these main four points and if you're on the right side of these which you would naturally be if you're if you if, if you're taking care of your customer customer's data then yeah you should be fine but it felt like that was a very long-winded response to your question now is that okay yeah that's fine thanks Good. And okay, so here again, if you want to do this in your own time and go through the steps that I've just taken on MailChimp, um, I've got step-by-step -step instructions here on the slides, which I'll share in the in the marketing hub. Then, 
So the MailChimp getting started, I left that out of this session because I wanted to keep it fairly concise, um, going over the GDPR first and foremost, and then a few tips for getting started with email marketing. Um, I wanna do another session on email marketing where we go more into how to actually use MailChimp to create really amazing emails and email newsletters. Um, yeah, so that would be something I'll do in another session. And then also the other thing I wanna do when I go into uh, MailChimp in more detail is talk about customer segmentation, um, which is another really useful way to personalize your emails and get better results for your marketing. But I would say from here, that's slightly, slightly more advanced, but not much. Um, so here's just some ideas to get started um, with your email list. So it's just ways to get people to join your mailing list. So first of all, it's send, send an email to, uh, actually that's on another slide. So um, mm -mm. Mm. yes, okay, cool. That's So I'm gonna skip ahead to an example, which is um, Health and Local Food Hub, which is Al's Food Hub, and what Al did to grow his email list. And this was, so he sent an email to all of Health and Local Food Hub's customers. And this is just a summary of the kind of things that he said in the email. So first of all, he thanked customers for their support, um, which is good because it's starting the email on a positive foot. It's, it's like, act and also it's thanking customers, which is always a, a good thing to do. Then giving an, he gave a really nice overview of the hub success, um, which is, you know, I've talked before about the three E's of marketing. It's kind of provoking that emotional response from your customers and helping them feel part of your success. It's a, it's a good thing to do. And, and then um, I'll give a reason why health and local food hub should continue. So I thought this was really effective because he outlined the benefits to the customer. So for example, he, explained that he yeah that it would that he health and local food hub could continue to bring delicious local food to people which is a benefit to the customer and a really good reason why health and local food hub should grow and should continue and then uh, he invited customers to support them further by joining their mailing list so this was a direct ask of support us by joining us and this is how you can support us further and uh, which is again it's it's effective because it's telling customers what they can do to help. Um, you'll find that if people are buying from you already, then they're, they're already engaged with what you're doing and they already believe in what you're doing. And it's likely that if customers are buying from your hub, being part of the alternative food movement, that they, yeah, they, they believe in the ethos of what you're doing as well. So in inviting customers to support you, it makes your customers feel part of something bigger, it makes them feel that they're being helpful, yeah. which again, it's that kind of, people feel good when they do something helpful. So it's, I thought that was a really effective way to, yeah. And to, to phrase, rather than please join our mailing list, it was like, you can, you know, if you join our mailing list, it'll be supporting us further, or you can support us further by joining our mailing list. And then this was a really key point and is really about a really good example of GDPR compliance or GDPR bonus points was um, Al explained really clearly what they were planning to do with customers' emails who joined their list. So for example, letting customers know about new produce, uh, letting um, customers know when order cycles were opening and closing and also that they were going to send an email newsletter with news and updates. So again, it's that explaining what you're going to do. And then as a bonus, ask customers to follow Health and Local Food Hub on Facebook and also to check out their shop front. So this was really good for another reason, which I'll go into in a second, and that's that I'll only used three links in the email. As three is the magic number, you don't ever really want to put more than three links in a marketing email. So but all of these three links were really useful. So the result of this is that um, the, the email helped to increase subscribers from 24 to 47 and increase subsequent orders, which is a really awesome result and can really demonstrate how effective email is at 
yeah, at, at developing a mutually beneficial relationship with your customers. So well, that's a really good example. What I'm going to do as well um, in the Marketing Hub group on Facebook with these slides and this webinar is I'm going to also add a couple of template emails that you can copy and paste and edit um, so that it's personalized for you. That will help you do this if you want to contact your customers via email in the same way and encourage them onto your email list then i'll yeah there'll be a couple of templates for you to try um and also yeah um let me know if you'd like more details on how to build a landing page on mailchimp or if that part wasn't clear or if you need any more further details on how to work with MailChimp, because I might be able to do an additional session um, where we can walk through you actually doing it and they can help you with it. So let me know, because sometimes it's easy when you're watching someone else do it, and then when you sit down and do it yourself, it's not as intuitive as you thought. But MailChimp is, is definitely one of the easiest, um, easiest email software to use. So, sorry, just down. And the reason I brought this up is because there's some really, that's a way, so first of all, that was a really good way to build a GDPR compliant email list because then those customers who received that email then followed the link to go to the landing page where they then gave their details to opt in to Al's email list. It didn't have the GDPR tick box that we had in the MailChimp um, example I just showed, but it's okay because even by filling out that form again, that is showing consent to being emailed. So yeah, so that's that. So that's that's that was a really good approach, and and that, so that's one way. So sending an email out to all of your existing customers is one way to build your email list. Another is more kind of hands-on and face-to-face. -face. You could ask your customers when you see them to join your email list. So you could give them flyers, for example, with a link to, with that link on the flyer, or you could, if you don't wanna, if you wanna do like zero waste, then you could ask them and if, you know, and give them the link, or you could even offer, you, know, you could put it up, put the link up on your phone and ask them to fill it in for you. Um, sorry, let's have glass of water. losing my voice today and yeah a little note it could even be a handwritten note in their delivery where you could just the the links are quite short so that's one way of doing it as well and you could also have for example on your facebook page you could share the link um you could share the link to the landing page on your facebook page and then pin that to the top and then as this goes to your facebook page and they can join through there um, or again, you could, I think emailing customers is probably the easiest way. You could have a, you know, an old school kind of written form as well. So you could print out a piece of paper um, and just get, or even just get people to write down their name and email address. And then do you agree for me to contact you via email and then explain, and then they could just tick that. And as long as you saved that piece of paper or scanned it into a computer, that would count as consent. And yeah, so another tip here is just, to remember that email activity, it, like em emailing people is, it's also a conversation. So it's not just kind of throwing information at people. It's, and this is another reason why I thought Al's email was so effective. With Al's permission, I'm, I might kind of share it on the screen if in it later, if that's okay. Um, it was really effective because it was, like kind of pulling the customer in. And I think there was a couple of questions in there. So it felt like very, con and also the style of writing was very conversational. It was as if he was writing to a friend, um, which was really effective. Oh. And that's because emails are really, uh, it's a much more personal way of connecting with your customers compared to social media. So your tone could be a lot more conversational, a lot more personal as if you know the person you're speaking to. And just some tips to get started. So if this is your first kind of, steps in, into email marketing is reminding people about your order cycles. That's something that is really a give email because your your customers will want not want to miss your order cycle. And if they see that it's a nice reminder for them, they'll think it's nice that I'm being reminded. 
Um, I know me personally that I'm frustrated when I've missed um, order cycle windows or if, yeah, and if there's something that I really wanted and then I skip because just life gets in the way and I've forgotten. So it's, yeah, so it's a nice thing to do. So that's a good place to start. And also it's a fairly simple email. So you don't have, it's not, there's, there's no risk of overthinking it. Um, and in an order cycle reminder, you could put like a lovely photo of your fresh produce and just reminding people of what's going to be available. And another really nice one is a, what, starting off with welcome emails when you have new customers. So you could have an onboarding email. So whenever you have a new customer and you could go into more kind of stuff on automation as well in a later session. Um, but you could do these manually to start, but you could send, or you could do it maybe once a week to all of the new email addresses in your email, um, in your email list, and just to welcome new customers. And then you could also, if you want to do a weekly or monthly newsletter, and that's a really nice way of kind of developing the customer relationship with your business and with your enterprise, because it's a way to kind of tell stories and also to involve them in the things that are happening for you. and yeah and the one thing with newsletters i would say that i'm going to come to in some of my advice here is to make it i'm going to get skip to this one is to keep it succinct so on average at the moment pete it used to be about i think about 40 seconds that people would spend reading an email maybe 10 years ago um now it's around five seconds so the the yeah so that window of capturing people's attention is quite small. Um, so you want to keep it quite succinct. And the, I think here the rule of threes is good. So no more than three links, I, a link to your shop front, maybe a link to your Facebook page and no more than three pictures. So yeah, and for example, if you do have a website and you're writing blogs, you could have say maybe one blog story um, one reminder for people to follow you on Facebook and then you could maybe put in a like a short story actually in the body of the email um, but yeah three images and three links would be the limit that's quite good when it comes to sending newsletters because I found with newsletters that they can become a bit of a like not like they, they can they can really expand and <laughs> can be sort of an object of kind of like they can almost become something that you dread sending out every month because you're trying to think of, yeah, like you end up with like 10 different items in it that you need to collect things for. So actually just keeping them short and sweet and maybe doing a bi-weekly newsletter with just three three topics in. And it, it that's quite a nice, it's a, it's a nice thing to do because it doesn't take too much work or thought or consideration. And you can also keep the content within the three pieces of content succinct as well. It's just that kind of, yeah, maintaining that that conversation, that relationship. So I'm going to go back to the previous page. And the other thing is to make, make it personal. So there's another reason why this is important. And that's that when you're sending emails, if the email is personalized to someone, which you can do via MailChimp, and I can show you how if we've got time at the end of this session or in the next session, and that's that if it's got someone's name, then it's not just how the person reacts because it's more is personalized to them, but it also improves deliverability. So it means that, I mean, this isn't a massive problem, but it just means that your email is more likely to get delivered to someone's inbox rather than their spam box if it's got their name in it. So it's just a way that, for example, particularly in Gmail inboxes um, where the spam protection is really strong. So, Sometimes emails can get filtered if they don't if they don't have a person's name in, and this is also a reason not to use things like exclamation marks um, in subject lines because it, that's you know anything that's like free or win or any of the really kind of things that you would also personally think would be spammy in your subject line because they could get it's likely they get filtered into spam. So. And the other thing is in the in the body of the right, if you're writing, is also to use direct language like you and your instead of I and we. So try and talk to your customer more um, instead of talking about yourself. But it's okay to blend the two. But it's just again, it's think as if you're writing to a friend. And also, 
you can make it engaging and use email as a conversation. So, and I, this is a way of doing this is by asking questions in the email. This, I, again, with the caveat, if you hate emails and you don't want to receive any emails, then maybe don't do this. But it's also, it's again, it's building that personal relationship with your customers. So this is quite effective if you're more on the smaller end of the scale, because um, you're less likely to be bombarded with emails. And in the earlier days when you're smaller, it's good to create those really solid personal relationships, because then as you expand, you're creating advocate relationships who have customers who have been there from the start who will be your strongest advocates and allies and this helps to kind of build well word of mouth um, and uh, this is a really important one it's remembering that people who give you their email addresses are interested in your enterprise and want to hear from you this is going back to the same point that i brought up at the beginning and that's that you've got to be really confident that the people that you're emailing want to hear from you and email marketing has a bit of bad press um, because, yeah, people complaining about having cluttered inboxes. But, like, you, you've got to be confident in, in what you're doing and that what you're offering your customers is valid and worthwhile. And also it's believing in your relationship with your customers and that they want to hear from you. And the other one here is to test, test what you're doing. And that's really important because it's, if someone asks what works with email marketing, it's like, it, it's just so broad because it's just such a massive topic and it's completely different depending on different enterprises and audiences and niches and all of these things. So you've really got to test. And so like, for example, tap, you know, to decide what day works best for you, maybe try sending your email on different days of the week. So if you're doing an order cycle reminder, you could try it on a Monday, you could try it the night before. So it's just working out what works best for you. And yeah, you can only do that through, through testing yourself. And the other thing is to have the email to come from your enterprise name. So there's kind of another older thinking with email marketing to have it come from a personal name. Um, but actually, if it's coming from a business name, it's not a bad thing. And it's also that your customer is building a relationship with your enterprise. Um, and if you're a really small scale, if you're a really small scale company, it's just, you know, and you have that personal one on -re one relationship with your customers, then that can be an exception to this. And this is my rule of three. So three images and three links per email. Um, I've put here a link to a headline analyzer which I found really useful for creating really good subject lines for your emails. So you can click through and you could try it out. Um, so the other thing is like testing what subject lines work for you. So it's the same thing with testing. So you could try short ones, you could try long ones, you could try questions, you could try emojis, it's totally up to you. And then, yeah, just keep, keep an eye on which ones tend to be opened more or, yeah. The other thing is, again, it's about deliverability. Double check your emails that there are no broken links um, because this, again, could impact the deliverability of your email and Gmail in particular could mark it as spam. And so I've created here an email marketing checklist. So this is a couple of actions that you could walk through following the session. And I'd be really interested to hear if anyone is up for doing this and would like to feedback about it um, or if anyone wants to do this and would like any additional support going through it let me know um, so first of all it would be to set up your own mailchimp account if you haven't already then to set your gdpr preferences up on mailchimp as i've outlined in slide eight then to create your own email sign up landing page then Send a standard email to all of your customers asking them to sign up to your, email, your mailing list. Include the link to your email sign up landing page in that email. And you can also do what Al did and add a link to your Facebook page and to your shop front as well for additional bonuses. Um, and I'm going to include a couple of email templates here to make this step even easier that you can amend and work with, but it sometimes helps to have a place to start. Um, I've find sometimes the blank screen can be a bit intimidating, particularly if you're sending an email to all of your customers at once. So having a starting point can be really helpful. And then post 
the landing page link on Facebook, inviting all of your Facebook page followers to sign up to your email list as well. And you could also send this, um, yeah, this is something that you could also, if you're part of any local groups, as long as it doesn't contravene the group's guidelines, you could also post this to your groups as well that you're in and with a nice caption explaining why you want people to sign up to your mailing list and what you do. And then create an email template in MailChimp reminding your customers to order. So starting off with an order cycle email, because I imagine this would be the simplest one to create. Um, and yeah, also MailChimp is quite intuitive. So if you're creating this kind of, if you're starting with a more simple formed email, it's a good place to start. Um, it gets a little bit more complicated when you're adding your audience and getting to the actual sending part, but we could do another session on this where we, I can walk through it step by step. Um, also, if anyone needs any one-to-one -one support on this, um, I'm, I'm really happy to help. So, okay, so I think that's the end of my slides. Again, thank you and please join our growing Facebook marketing help group. Got lots of plans for this um, in the coming weeks and months. And here's a couple of things that I'm also going to share. And that's the templates. And I'm also going to create an order cycle reminder template for your MailChimp that you can follow the link and it will download it to your MailChimp. So you can then personalize it. And that's my slide. So I've given us five minutes for questions, which is perfect timing. So I feel like I'm losing my voice. So I'm going to stop sharing. And go back to the screen. I, oh, okay, so from Al, to find share. So in that case, I'm gonna share again and just show you what made this email so good. So I think it was really, it covered so many good points. Um, so I think this will be interesting for you guys as well. So here, first of all, this is the, this is the great email and it started off with thanking everyone for their support. Um, the customers and that's a really nice thing to start with um, and also we really talk about how much Al appreciated it and also this bit's really nice where he talks about yeah a, a bit of kind of the hubs news but also kind of sharing a really positive success story this has this kind of effect of making customers feel like um, they're like part of a group and also it's that I, it's a bit of a cheesy marketing thing, but it's like, oh yeah, a hundred other people are doing it. Also, I must be doing the right thing. It's that kind of like the like the positive herd thing. Um, so I thought that was really effective. Um, and it also shows the scope of what, what they've been doing as a, as a startup, which is amazing. And um, talking about new things coming. So it's this exciting new news. So it's this really lovely intro paragraph, um, which I thought was really effective. And again, like really highlighting how the customer support and customers really important um, in this picture, which I thought was really effective and really nice. And I'd have been really chuffed as a customer to receive this. And then here it's kind of talking, I thought it was really effective how like Al explains the context um, of things. Yeah, like the very real issue that with lockdown, finishing people starting to move back to previous buying habits which yeah I, I think it's a good thing to bring up and I love how it's phrased here in a really positive way that it's saying that this is happening and then talks about it that's really important that health and local food hub continues to grow and links that to the customer benefit which is supporting a local food economy alongside those other suppliers so it's not actually even saying anything negative about like you know any any of the other competitors it's that yeah it's that existing alongside so it's, it's just phrased in a really positive way and encourages customers to want to support want to support house and local food hub to continue to provide these benefits to the community and to offer you regular access to local food it's a great benefit and then here this is where it's really clearly explained what the email um what what Health and Local Food Hub are going to do with the email information. And this is really great. It's again, it's building that customer trust. So it's outlines very clearly. This is 
really good work with GDP with the kind of you know working with the GDPR rules. So really impressed with this. And um, also really effective to have a kind of to also include an order cycle um, reminder in this email. So that's then it's also the other GDPR thing of this using implied consent in in a way with integrity. So this email is also um, providing the customers with something that they've they would be interested in as a customer of health and local food health. And um, then these are the three links. So again and yeah, so I thought this was a really effective example and. Yeah, I was really inspired by this. So great work, Mel. So thanks for letting us share it. And cool. So any questions, everybody? How often would you do an email? I mean, I've been doing weekly, a weekly sort of newsletter, which is all also works as a reminder. But um, and I think I've probably said I'm not going to write to you more than once a week, so I can't really back, back down on that maybe, but is once a week about right? Or... Yeah, I think, it, again, this is the thing with email marketing, it totally depends on your audience. So once per week is is fine. It's very unlikely that your customers will be annoyed <laughs> with a message once per week. It meant like lots of brands do a lot more than that. Um, so I think once a week is fine. And also, again, if you're sending a newsletter that's wrapped up with an order cycle reminder, that's actually a really lovely combo because you're doing a similar thing of giving a little bit of positive news as well as something that's useful for your customer, i.e. reminding them to order. So, and also that's, it also means that that email is working for you as well. You're actually gaining an obvious, um, you're gaining an obvious goal from that email because then it, people will be ordering or reminded to order. So I think that's a really effective approach just once a week. So a long way of saying yes, <laughs> once a week is good. Um, some people might want to do less or some, another way that might work is doing like a really short weekly order cycle reminder with maybe a, like a little, some a story or you could do a produce focus and then the order cycle reminder. So like focusing on one item of produce that week or a couple, and then do like a monthly newsletter letter, which is a bit more about your kind of enterprise news, or you could do like your end, like a summary of any of your enterprise news, as well as maybe like once a month, you could do a, 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 a highlight one of your growers and do a little mini story on them. So it's, yeah, that could be another way of doing it. So, but I think once per week is, yeah, it's, it's good. It's definitely a good start. And yeah. Thanks for the question, Al. Is there anything else, any other questions? Hi, Kay. It's Rachel from Team Hi. Valley Food. Hi, Rachel. Hi. Hello. Yeah, good. Thank you. Um, I was just wondering if you knew much about QR codes because I've seen that Mailchimp can create a QR code for your newsletter, and I was just wondering if it might be something that we could add on to our invoices potentially, um, yeah. or sign up if there's a QR form that you can create for a sign up form. So it's just another add-in way to kind of build your mailing list. And I don't know if if they're still thought as reasonably effective QR codes or... Um, yeah, I, mean, I think that's a good idea. And it's again, it's like anything that makes it easier for your customer to mm -hmm. join your mailing list is a good thing. Um, so a QR code is a good thing, so it's easy for your customer to just scan it and go. Um, it So if your invoice is a paper, paper based then yeah QR card QR code is a really great way to to make that process easy for your customer mm -hmm. uh, if there's anything digital then definitely a link works better um but that's yeah it's a really good idea um I think people are still using QR codes and most people now know what know what they are and would you know be able to kind of use use their phone to make that happen so yeah it's a good idea maybe we could um, print out QR code on stickers or something to stick on our reusable, yeah. nice, fancy delivery boxes as well, perhaps. Yeah, that's a good idea. Maybe with a sticker with the QR code and then just um, like a little note, like join our mailing list here. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, that's a really good idea. Thanks for thanks for adding that one to the session, Rachel. Awesome. <laughs> Thank you. 
Any other questions? Uh. Hi, actually, Hi. I just wanted to add something about the previous question um, about how often to send uh, email marketing. Um, I call you from France, huh? that's why you, you hear my very clear accent. Um, due to my experience, and I have one data about email marketing, is that um, people open an email the day where they receive it. After one day, they don't open it anymore. So it's also important to question when your audience is um, uh, reading its emails. You know, and this will be characterized by who are your are your uh, audience? Uh, will they more watch their emails during their uh, work or in the morning in breakfast or in the night? And so it's important to question this and then to try to send the email in this timing. Absolutely, yeah. That's a really good point. And it, it kind of comes back to always thinking of your, your customer. Who are they? What do they do? Where, where can you reach them? When can you reach them? It's that constant process of thinking who, who is your customer and how to reach them. And yeah, and that's the thing with but then also, again, it's that it is different for different companies. So, like, for example, if your audience are people who are likely to work a nine to five job, then emails that are in their inbox on a Monday morning, for example, are probably a good idea. Sending one in the afternoon on a Friday is probably not a good idea because then they're not going to get it until Monday. So it's, yeah, so they might not check the emails over the weekend. But then if you're, so it really depends on your audience. And this is why I think testing is so key for this. And then you can work out what, what you know, you can start with your best guess of when you think your audience are likely to be looking at the emails. But then also, yeah, it's it could be an ongoing process of finding that perfect time for you and your enterprise. So, yeah, thanks for bringing that one out up. And yeah, nice to nice to hear from you from France. So thanks for joining us. Um, do we have any other questions? We're slightly overrunning, so sorry for that, everybody. But if um, yeah, if there's any questions, that would be great. Otherwise, I'm going to put this just for the question that I've seen in the chat box. Um, this presentation is going to be uploaded in our marketing hub group on Facebook. So it's it's you can find it by searching Open Food Network Marketing Hub and there's a unit section on the group and this will be unit four. So we'll have the slides, we'll have a recording of this webinar and also the two templates that I said I'd share. So everything will be there. And also please um, feel free to interact on the Facebook group. Um, I want to do another further session on how to use MailChimp. Um, so if that's, yeah, I might do a poll on the group and just see what topics are of use to people. Uh, if there's anything that you want to cover in these sessions, then please let me know there. It's great to have your feedback. And yeah, so thank you everyone for joining. So I'm kind of losing my voice a little bit today. But, um, I'll be yeah looking forward to seeing you all next week where we're going to be covering Instagram so Instagram best practice so we're starting everything off with more kind of overview content so next week will be very much uh, kind of best practice and tips for using Instagram and then gradually the the webinars will be getting more and more detailed um, you can see any of the previous content in the marketing hub group so we've got all of the different webinars that we've done there and yeah so thanks everyone for coming and hope to see you in the marketing group and hope you yeah have a great rest of the week bye everyone thanks, bye. thank you thank you bye, bye.